Alex here with part 134 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As with my previous videos, I'll take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero if you haven't seen it yet. That's the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my excess parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight-year-long high-conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. We are going into a hearing video. This is regarding the state against the Secretary of State and the confidential address program. Now, I think that my mindset at the time was mostly good going into this hearing. I felt like with the Supreme Court's publication, the judge would take the case seriously. I also felt like the fact that my ex hadn't filed any papers in the case was a good sign that she probably wouldn't show up and oppose it. Though at the same time, there's always that nagging doubt. Maybe, you know, just maybe she'll just show up <laughs> and then go to the hearing only. Um, in hindsight, looking back, I think that I should have been a lot more worried. And this is not 100% to the credit of a viewer uh, throwing this out there because I kind of figured this on my own as well, though the viewer, I wish I could remember their name, was absolutely correct. This judge is showing a pattern of trying to find reasons to rule against me. And um, this viewer actually specifically mentioned a technical detail that I like to bring up sometimes, and that is that the judge could hear the testimony of both sides, me and my ex, and he could just declare that he believes her. He could just proclaim it from the bench that she's telling the truth. And just like that, we have a finding of fact supported by substantial evidence, which I can't get disturbed on appeal. Um, and those are all the things that the viewer mentioned. So whoever this was, throw it in the comments below if you remember yourself. I'm sorry that I can't remember which one of you specifically. But yes, that's, that's something that could occur. And um, given some of the patterns of this judge, it's something now in hindsight that I realize he may have done which is really scary because that's beyond an abuse of discretion. That's just a complete and total abuse of, of, of authority. So anyway, um, as I've mentioned a number of times in the series, she doesn't show up at this hearing. And so um, it doesn't go that way. We don't have to worry about that uh, worst case scenario. But I did want to let my viewers know that that particular detail is a scary thing that can occur with judges who are trying to find reasons to rule against you. If you want to learn more about what I was talking about, take a look at the video standard of review. That's what discusses the uh, standard that the appellate courts apply to questions of law versus questions of fact and how they have given the lower court judges deference on their findings of fact, which is something that they don't do on their conclusions of law. Anyway, <clears throat> with all of that being said, why don't we go ahead and get straight into the hearing video. District Court of the State of Nevada is now in session. The Honorable Chuck Lowe presiding. Sir, would you please raise your right hand and be sworn? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this case show the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. So as I was going through editing and um, putting together the mid-roll presentation as well as the little card that says bench trial, I thought to myself, there's no way that I knew back in 2013 that this was a bench trial. Back then, I just thought a hearing was a hearing and anything goes in hearings. And um, I didn't you know, get the distinction of evidentiary hearings versus other types of hearings. But yes, a uh, bench trial is a trial where the judge is going to be the finder of fact and, um, of course, you know, the one that comes up with the conclusions of law based on those findings of fact, there is no jury. And the reason that I wanted to stop and bring this up is because I had probably no clue back then that I was supposed to put on a case, that I was supposed to, um, you know, present what's it called, opening statements and then go through my case in chief and their case in chief and submit evidence to the court and question witnesses. And these are things that I didn't prepare for that I should have prepared for. It's just... I didn't know what was going on. I had no help. There was no the proper person channel for me to go to to learn these things. And I don't want you guys to look at this video and think that just because Alex won, everything went well. 
I should have known these things and I should have been prepared for these things and hopefully you guys are more prepared just in case your ex or your opponent does show up and you actually do have to put on a trial. The ability to teach you guys how to participate in a trial is for the most part I think impossible by word of mouth, by me just speaking to you. The only thing that I can recommend is for you to go to the Art Nevada Judges channel and actually watch the trials because that's the only way that it can really sink in the the flow the format the phases and the questioning of witnesses is so important i can't just talk to you you have to see it for yourself you have to see the judges and the attorneys and the witnesses in the process to really get your head around it that is what you should prepare for for a hearing like this don't just go into court thinking it's just any old run-of-the-mill hearing that you're going to just stand there and talk to the judge as if you know it's like a judge judy show where both sides just kind of talk to the judge these are very formal processes and you have to plan for these and you have to know what you're doing i'm going to tell you right now i'm going to win this hearing because my ex isn't here but i didn't know what i was doing and i didn't under understand the significance of any of this um the second thing that i wanted to mention to you guys is i'm at a huge advantage here because I am the only person that can present evidence to the court. I am the only one who can enter testimony into the record, which the court then will make findings on. My ex isn't there, and the government hasn't brought any witnesses. Kevin Benson is the attorney for the government. He cannot enter evidence into court from his own mouth. In, in other words, what the Supreme Court of Nevada calls this is... Um, Arguments of counsel. Arguments of counsel are not evidence, nor are they considered facts. These are the two, or that's the one, big principle that comes up with attorneys where people get frustrated that attorneys are saying things and the judge is believing them. Well, that can be true maybe for allegations, and that can be true maybe for a non-evidentiary hearing where the judge is making temporary orders. But once you get to a trial, or once you get to an evidentiary hearing, all of a sudden, that attorney's lost a lot of power because they themselves can no longer state things and hope and cross their fingers that the judge is going to just go ahead and, and take that as true. Now, they actually have to get evidence into the record somehow. And Kevin Benson, who is the attorney for the Secretary of State, he is just the attorney. He does not count as a witness, and so he can't even get evidence in. So I'm at a huge advantage here because I am the only one that's going to be able to put evidence into uh, the record. And the other thing that I want to state is if you are in this advantageous position, keep that in mind. Don't ruin your own case. Don't enter testimony that is harmful to you. There's no reason to try and argue your opponent's case. Just keep in mind you're the only one there. You're the only one that can get evidence into the court and present to the court only the evidence that is favorable to you. You don't have to put on your opponent's case. That's their job. If they didn't want to show up, that's on them. We're on the record in the matter of Alexander Falcone versus the Secretary of State. I recognize Mr. Falcone. Your appearance, sir? Kevin Benson, Deputy Attorney General on behalf of the Secretary of State. Okay. I note that the record shows that... Um, Mrs. Falcone, is that her name? Mrs. Oh, Farr. Farr. It was noticed of this hearing and is not present and has not filed any pleading in this matter. Um, so it appears, I, I, it, from everything that's been filed, I think I know what I'll, I'm going to do, so I'll tell you what I have in mind and you can comment on it if you, if you choose to. Um, the Supreme Court informs us that a custodial parent generally has a right to know where his or her child resides, even when the child is in the other parent's custody. And so by demonstrating that he or she, sh she shares joint legal custody, a parent may meet the, meets the initial burden of proving that, that he has a right to know where the co-parent lives with the child. In this case, mom has a confidential address under Nevada's Address Confidentiality Program. And the issue is whether I should order the Secretary of State to reveal that address. Because father meets the initial burden by being a joint custodial parent, the burden then shifts to mother to show why the address should be maintained as confidential. 
by not appearing in this case, she is not meeting her burden. It's my understanding that the Secretary of State's position is, is that they have no position, that they'll do whatever the court orders. That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. Sir, do you have anything else to say? Um, I was just going to ask if you wanted me to argue costs now or file a motion after. Excuse me? To argue costs now or to file a motion after the writ issues. I can do it either way. It's fine. Yeah, I, I want you to file a um, motion for costs. So I remember when I, <laughs> I remember the look on his face when I, I never forgot this. He had this smirk, like he couldn't believe that I wasn't happy with what I was getting. I never forgot that look on his face. Anyway, I filed a motion for costs as he directed. He denied the motion. I filed an appeal and it reversed. So, I mean... Okay, so based on that, then I'm going to grant, uh, I will issue a written order saying that the Secretary of State needs to reveal the mother's confidential address to father. Thank you, Your Honor. I think that that would be sufficient. I just want to be clear that the order only reveals that it be, or excuse me, only orders that it be revealed to the father and that it's not public record or anything like that. That's what I intend to do. Sir, does that sound fine to you? Oh, right. I just wonder if it matters whether it's an order or a writ of mandamus, or I guess it doesn't matter. Well, I'll make sure that it's in the right format. It'll be a, a, an enforceable order to the Secretary of State saying to release the address to you. Okay. It'll just take a couple of days to be issued. He actually doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> he issues the writ of mandamus as an order that he signs, which is not how it works. He's supposed to enter an order granting petition, and in the order granting petition, it directs the clerk of the court to issue a writ of mandamus. Then the clerk of the court will typically issue the writ, they will sign the writ, and then they will attach like an exhibit or a copy of the, the order from the court. So, I mean, it's fine, it works, but my concern here that this judge might not really know what he's supposed to do is a valid concern because he doesn't know what he's supposed to do. I've seen issue, uh, writs of mandamus and prohibition issued from the Supreme Court, and they never sign the writ themselves. They just enter the order granting petition, they sign the order granting petition, they direct this clerk of the Supreme Court to issue the writ of mandamus. I'm not sure that this t uh, technical stuff really matters, but I do know that at the time, back then, I had concerns that whatever was entered by this judge wouldn't be valid because of the patterns that I had seen from the Supreme Court of Nevada on their issuance of writs or how they you know, handle the process of issuing writs. Now, with all these years of me having reviewed all these orders from the Supreme Court because of the Art Nevada judge's work, it doesn't seem to me like it really matters that much as long as it has um, the correct label. I guess the judge can sign it. Who knows? Um, if anyone out there knows any different, let me know. Post it down in the comments, but let's keep going. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Going into the aftermath, I didn't file anything, so um, I incurred zero dollars in costs. My ex's attorney didn't participate, so she incurred zero dollars in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. My ex didn't appear, so she incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. The government didn't file anything, so they incurred zero dollars in costs, and they would have had spent some time in prep, some time driving to and driving back from the hearing because I believe that they sent the uh, Mr. Benson from Carson City, if I remember correctly. So assuming that they have to sort of cover the costs of the drive, waiting around, and then up the hearing itself, which wasn't very long, I don't think it would be unreasonable to say two hours. Um, at the rate of $250 an hour, that's going to come to $500 in attorney fees for the government. As with my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.